All right, so hi, thanks for coming. I can't believe how many people are here. I'm totally stunned. So it's early for DEF CON. Uh, you know, there's ATM jackpotting going on. There, in another talk, there's a, there's a Playmate of the Year or something, right? Uh, it's, I know, that's fine. I, I saw her though, she's not that cute, so. Uh, and uh, what else? So the, I mean, anyway, I was really surprised there's people here, so thanks for coming. And uh, I, I was like, optimistically, the room will be empty. Everyone who can't get into Barnaby Jack's talk will then be like, well, what the hell do we do now? And they might wander in, but uh, yeah, thanks for coming. All right, so this talk, uh, and I warn you, it's, it's, there's probably too much material, so I'm gonna probably end up skipping stuff, but I'll make the slides available online, so if I gl gloss over something you're more interested in, check out the slides and, and see. Um, so this talk is supposed to be uh, uh, sort of a, a, a fictional story of, um, so I, you know, I travel and give talks around the world, and so like what would happen if like one day I was, you know, visiting some foreign country and, you know, next thing I knew there's like a bag over my head, and a couple hours later I wake up and I'm in, you know, beautiful downtown, uh, you know, some city in North Korea. And uh, <laughs> Kim Jong-il and his, you know, his friends are, are there insisting that, that I help them build a cyber army to attack the US. So, so this is the story. So, and, and when you're in that situation, you know what you say, right? Yes, sir, right? So for that. <laughs> here we go, here's my, my uh, Korean military uniform right. for the day. All right. So, ready to fight, yeah. So who's, who's with me, right? Okay. So uh, yeah, that's what, that's what you say. Yes, uh, you know, devoted leader. Okay, so, uh, so what am I gonna talk to you guys about? So a little about me. Uh, normally I would just skip that, but this talk is all sort of like, you know, like BS and, and all that. So I wanna sort of convince you I know what I'm talking about. And then uh, some background stuff, strategies I would employ, uh, potential attacks, things that my cyber army would have to do, things I could imagine uh, defensively, uh, the US or whatever country we were attacking would try to do and why it wouldn't work. And then uh, exactly how I would, I would have the army, you know, who would be in it, what kind of people, how much it would cost, that sort of stuff. Um, then how long I would need to set up, what exactly I would do, and uh, then, you know, conclusions and lessons learned. Okay, so, uh, w so why am I talking about, uh, you know, cyber war? So out of the blue, some guy from NATO calls me, uh, like, three or four months ago, and he's like, hey Charlie, we'd like you to come to Estonia and give us a talk about cyber war. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm really good, I, you know, I'm like a low-level tech guy, I don't know how to like break into computers and stuff like that, but I don't really know much about, you know, cyber war. So I don't know, uh, you know, policies, I don't know, you know, what country has what, or, you know, anything like that, I just know how to break into computers. And so I'm like, sorry, you know, I'm gonna have to decline. But then the more I thought about it, and then I started reading like, uh, you know, Richard Clark's book, and I was like, man, you know, most of the people who are talking about cyber war, they don't really know, they might know what they're talking about, but they don't really know like the details, like I know, right? Um, so I thought, oh, that'd be kind of fun. Uh, you know, and, and I was like, well, what do you really want me to talk about? And he's like, well, anything you want. I was like, well, you know, I'll talk about what I know, which is offense. So, I'll, I, so, so he convinced me to come, I gave the talk, and uh, you know, there were some technical guys there, mostly like policy types. There was an uh, ex-former uh, cyber czar of the US was there watching my talk, and apparently she was like, you know, didn't like it or something, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, that's your boss? No, she was probably lost. Oh, yeah, maybe. It's not too technical, that, like, you know, my, my talk of Black Hat had, like, hundreds of slides with, like, assembly, no, no assembly in this talk. Okay, so anyway, I was like, well, I'd like, you know, where else can I give this talk besides to these NATO guys? So I was like, well, you guys at DEF CON might appreciate it, so that's why I'm here. Okay, so who am I? Uh, I'm a PhD in math, worked for a year, reading firewall logs, I used to work at the NSA for five years. Uh, I'm a consultant now, and that's basically what this talk is about. So it's it's a uh, it's like a proposal. So I do this all the time as a consultant. So uh, you know I'm good I'm good at a you know breaking in things and then b figuring out like how much stuff's going to cost, how much time it's going to take. So that's really what this 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 talk is. It's like a proposal to to a country to to build a cyber army. I did some other stuff too. Okay, so uh, so what about you? Don't hear much wh about what people say what they did at the NSA. Um, and for, for, for good reason, and I can't talk about it either, but there, I can't tell you bullets from my, my uh, resume that they approved, so these are things I can talk about without further comment. So uh, these are things I did about the NSA to show that like maybe I know what I'm talking about. So uh, perform computer network scanning and reconnaissance. Executed numerous computer network exploitations against foreign targets. Like I can't believe they allow me to say that, but they do. <laughs> um, network intrusion analysis designed and developed network intrusion, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, so I did some cool stuff as, as, a, as a, you know, NSA guy. 
Okay, so, so on to the basics. <laughs> By the way, it's cold in North Korea. I didn't know that. I didn't pack for it. <laughs> all right, so, um, so you know, the bottom line and all this stuff is money, right? So if you have enough money, you can do pretty much anything you want. So uh, just for some comparison of what people are spending on this sort of stuff. So the U.S. military spends, you know, a crap load of money. Uh, just on cyber alone, they spend $105 million a year. And these are all the things I found on Google. Like again, I said I'm not really an expert on this. Um, North Korea spends $5 billion, which is a ton for, for their little country. Um, on cyber warfare alone, they spend $56 million. So that's a lot. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, Iran, by comparison, you wouldn't think they would have one. They actually spend more, 76 million. And so the, what I'm going to propose is actually a bargain. $49 million and I can take down any country. <laughs> okay, so cyber warfare, what do I think it is, right? Everyone disagrees, so since I'm talking, I get to say what I think it is. It's collecting intelligence, controlling other systems, so, you know, making them do what maybe you don't want them to do. Maybe you just want to make, or people can't use the systems that they want to use, um, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe General Hayden, my old boss, would disagree, but you know, the general idea is you want to cause harm, like if you you launched missiles and stuff without actually having to, to go through that trouble of doing that. Okay, some more statistics just to get kind of get uh, uh, a realm on on you know some your head around some of these numbers because you know we're used to at least me as a pen tester we're used to like you know corporations or something. So so like it, now our target's sort of like the world. So so what sort of numbers are we talking about? It's like lots of you know a few billion IP addresses in the world. 2 billion personal computers, 41 million iPhones, so that's a lot of iPhones. Uh, what about botnets that you hear about? How big are they compared to, you know, all the computers in the world? Well, they range anywhere from like, you know, 3 to 10 million uh, computers. And so if you think about that as a percentage of all computers, it's still a fraction of 1%. So, you know, a very small percentage of computers. And if you think about like all the people you know that have computers that have no idea how they work, it's amazing that it's not larger actually. Okay, so here's a word I throw around, so just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, this remote access tool, RAT, so it's, you know, you can think of it like a rootkit or like, you know, the equivalent of like a really advanced interpreter or something. So it's something that, that you're going to put onto a computer that you've compromised that allow you continued access, allow you to then uh, attack other computers, um, you know, basically a way to, to, to contact this computer that you've broken into at some point. And I like it, so it should be hard to detect. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, so now uh, a little divergence into zero days, and I, I'll try not to spend too much time because you know this audience probably understands what a zero day is and, and why they're important. Uh, where the guys at NATO, like I don't know if they they really, I wanted to really emphasize like, hey, you know, there's these things called zero days. So uh, you know, as you know, it's for a, a bug that that there's no patch available for. Um, so so then I, I want to emphasize to them that these exist, and you know, you guys probably know that, but just for some stats. Uh, so 2005, so these are mostly ones I know about since, you know, I know about stuff I do. So um, 2005 I found a bug in Samba. It was around for two years. So you know, that's a long time for a bug. Uh, there's this one, this JBIG2 Adobe Reader vulnerability. Um, discovered in 2008. This is discovered by a bad guy this time. Uh, if, if you, I mean, I'm wearing a military uniform from Korea so maybe I'm not one to speak about who's good and who's bad. But uh, this is like a real bad guy. and. Uh, so he found it in 2008 and it, it didn't get par uh, patched until March even though people knew about it. So, you know, these zero days are floating around. Uh, Pwn in one year I found a bug but I didn't use it because you can only use one so I kept the second one for the next year. So a year went by, nothing happened. And then of course, I guess I dropped a zero day Adobe Reader 1 at Black Hat so, or a few days ago this week. So yeah, zero days exist. Okay, uh, what about like how long they're around? Because this is going to be kind of important because, you know, I'm going to have my, my army, you know, finding these zero days. So I want to know, you know, what their shelf life is. So these stats come from uh, Justin Itell, the CEO of Immunity, uh, the company that make, that brings you, uh, you know, uh, Canvas, uh, amongst other things. Uh, so uh, anyway, the average lifespan, she says, from from her statistics, 348 days, so just under a year. And the shortest one that they've ever had, 99 days, and the longest one was almost three years. So that, that'll give you an idea of how long you can expect your zero to, to sit around. Right, and then, uh, you know, from the defender's perspective, it's pretty tough to to find zero days because, you know, you don't know what they are. Um, this, uh, this little dialog box is like, I think it's a pretty funny story. So I had the zero day and, uh, you know, we were doing something with it for someone else, right? I can't say more than that. But anyway, uh, we were, nonetheless, we were testing it against lots, you know, lots of different targets. And I was like, well, you know, what about, we were trying to find all the Windows boxes we could. And I was like, oh, you know, what about the secretaries? We haven't tried hers. So, you know, I threw the, the zero day against it and it was like, boop, little pop-up. It's like buffer overflow blocked. I was like, what? 
McAfee detected my zero day. There's no way. So I was, yeah, it, it really worked. Um, except like the, the only like small piece of solace I had was if you read the description, it's like, oh, there's a buffer overflow, and I was like, ah, well, it wasn't actually a buffer overflow, but still they detected it. So it sort of sort of made me sad. But then of course you could you know get around it. But um, still, it, you can detect zero days just by using heuristics and stuff. Okay. So uh, next up, strategies. Yeah, they don't eat good either in North Korea. They eat some weird stuff. So. Uh, so here's my strategies. Dominate cyber space, and I'll go into more of these in detail. You have to work in advance. Uh, you got to rely on getting lots of research intelligence gathering, and then this thing you have to decide when you're going to throw your zero days and when you're going to throw your known exploits. Okay. So uh, what's this? What's this thing I mean when I say dominate cyber space? This is something that came up on the Daily Dave mailing list um, that, that kind of got me interested. So um, the idea, I think it's a good idea. So, so the idea is you want to control as many devices in the world as possible before you're up, you're ready to sort of launch your attack. And um, the idea is that if there really was some sort of you know cyber attack or cyber war or whatever you want to call it, um, presumably the internet would be kind of degraded, at least in, in places. And so if you control lots and lots of devices, then you can still perform your attack even if you can't connect to say the target anymore. So so that's one good thing. The other thing is uh, there's this problem with cyber war about attribution, right? So attribution is who did it. Uh, so you know, you, you maybe a computer from China is attacking, but really that computer is some some Russian dude who's logged into that computer, right? So you can't tell if it was Russia or China. Um, so the idea is with this dominate cyberspace is if you have, you know, all you know tons and tons and tons of computers located all throughout the world under your control, then uh, it's you're you're in a better position to decide who's attacking you because maybe they're attacking from one of the boxes you already control, in which case you can you know easily backtrace it. Uh, if not, maybe you're at least located in a computer nearby, right? In the same, you know, same subnet or, or whatever. So anyway, you have a better idea. And, and also, uh, on the opposite side, it's going to make attribution like really hard for your opponent because you're going to be able to attack from like a thousand different places and from all over the world, and they're not going to know who you are. Um, and, and the other thing is, if you already happen to have all these boxes throughout the world under your control. Then just by luck, sometimes you know Kim Jong Il is going to be like, "Hey, Charlie, uh, yeah, you know, we really want to get onto this network," and I'll be like, "Oh, you know, as a you know, as a matter of fact, I'm already on that network." Ha ha. <laughs> so, uh, and then of course the, the final point is that if you want to do something you know sort of loud like a denial of service, well, you're going to need a lot of computers to do that, so it's good anyway. So the idea is for this is is you want to just go out and just you know control lots and lots of computers. And this is the, the other reason why it's good to be North Korea as opposed to the U.S. because you know, there, there might be like laws and stuff that say you're not supposed to just take over everybody's computer for no reason, but like North Korea, they're cool with that. <laughs> okay, so uh, the next thing is, and that was already started talking about this, is advanced planning. So if you're going to try to get into like a really hard network, some military network, or you know, some, uh, you know, the, the network of the stock exchange, or something like that, it's going to take, you know, some, you're not just going to be able to wake up and do that, no matter how many guns I get pointed at my head. I'm going to be like, it's going to take me some time. So, uh, the other thing is it's going to be easier to not be detected if you go slow. So it's a key part of, of my, my thing is, is to take your time and, and, and do everything else. Uh, so, and, and likewise, part of taking your time is, is figuring out what you're doing and, and doing research. And figuring out uh, additionally what defenses and monitoring are in place so that you don't get caught. So, so like everyone who talks about you know, the Aurora attack right, and, and app and all that stuff. And uh, you know, I've had so many people tell me, "Oh, that Aurora attack, man, that was sophisticated, right?" And it was like, "No, it's not, because you know, if I was doing that attack, I wouldn't get caught. So it's not sophisticated." <laughs> um, the other question is, so you know, at some point, I'm going to have this stockpile of zero days and a stockpile of, of known vulnerabilities. When am I going to? And I want to get on somewhere. Which do I decide to use? And so it's going to be something you have to decide case by case. But uh, basically, if you if you choose to use a, a you know a known vulnerability, a known exploit. Then you know the advantages are you can just look like some you know teenage hacker, and, and also if you get busted, who cares? Uh, the zero days are going to be way harder to detect, so you might want to use those for you know the harder targets to get into. Um, but the problem is if you do get caught, then that's that's a lot of resources you've used to find that zero day and, and to, to to weaponize it, and so uh, it's going to be expensive in time and money to replace. Okay, so then there's some other things you might consider doing. Uh, so like Richard Clark is huge on on like oh logic bombs, logic bombs. So uh, like I I hadn't read that word since you know my I read Hacking Exposed 15 years ago or something, uh, but he loves it. And so the idea is that you you get into you know like the hardware of the other guys and you plant these things and then you just turn a switch and like the whole world ends. But I, I think it, I think it's kind of